you're fully aware that uh, this area of study, there are a lot of people who are very skeptical um, and the burden of proof uh, is so high that it can't just be one sensor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, <laughs> to use Avi's uh, parlance, you know, if we got a high resolution image of uh, some sort of craft with a bumper sticker that said, you know, built in Zeta Reticuli, um, I think, you know, there would be pushback from the scientific community if it was a single sensor. They would say yeah. some cosmic particle bounced off of Starlink and hit the sensor and created some artifact that looks like this object. And unfortunately, um, you know, I think that that would be comforting to a lot of people because uh, it's a difficult idea to wrap your head around that there may be something strange going on. So what we've done is is basically employ the scientific method and say, OK, every instrument needs to be highly calibrated and we need to understand the background. We need to understand how all of those instruments work together. Um, so at the end of the day, if we get an image of something, all of a sudden we have, you know, 10 other sensors that are telling part of the story. Welcome to Merge. Today, we're joined by Andy Mead. Andy is an acoustics engineer, and he's also the co-lead of the acoustics team at the Galileo Project. Andy, thanks for joining me. Awesome. Pleasure to be here. So where did your, your love of acoustics, if I may be so bold to claim it as that, <laughs> uh, when did that start? So uh, I was thinking about this in the, the lead up to the conversation, and I think it's uh, my dad's fault <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, uh, kind of all of this. So uh, my dad uh, grew up in the 50s and 60s, was a huge music fan. Uh, his dad was uh, an electrical engineer who worked at Bell Labs. Uh, so he grew up around technology and music uh, and was actually in college uh, during the Vietnam War. Uh, and he likes to say that he won the drafts. Uh, his, number <laughs> oh, was, his number was one. Uh, so he just assumed uh, he was going to head to Vietnam uh, after college uh, and ended up uh, the draft was dissolved his senior year. Uh, so he was kind of lost and, and went home to New Jersey uh, and was trying to figure out what to do next and uh, made the mistake of telling his dad that he thought he would backpack through Amsterdam uh, and move to New York City to become a drummer. Uh, so the his next dad liked day, that, I'm sure. Yeah, I loved it. Uh, next day, his dad showed up uh, with an application to law school and said, <laughs> fill this out. Uh, and that kind of sent him on his path. But uh, he never lost that love for music or that love for technology. So I grew up around lots of music, lots of uh, uh, sort of early adopter technology. Uh, I think there were recordings of me on a four track from when I was three uh, <laughs> and just got the bug early on uh, and that carried through all the way through middle school, uh, did a lot of recording, played in bands. It was kind of a vehicle for my music. Uh, and, you know, in the background, I was learning a lot, uh, mm -hmm. experimenting with microphones and phase, and I didn't know what I was doing, but was gaining that background and that foundation. Uh, and then the real turning point for me was uh, freshman year of high school. My parents, uh, the big Christmas present I got was uh, this box that said Pro Tools. And I had no idea what that was. Uh, it sounded like accounting software to me. Uh, it turns out it was uh, this new digital audio workstation software. Uh, and I think I've opened up Pro Tools every day since then, wow. uh, you know, 20, 20 plus years ago. Uh, so that kind of carried me through high school, uh, mostly, uh, again, recording for music, um, and then, uh, ended up going to, uh, Tufts University for college, uh, and got really, really lucky. The first couple of years kind of struggled, did more recording than studying, uh, <laughs> just cause that seemed like a better use of my time. Uh, sorry to my parents for that. Uh, but. I'm sorry too, mom. I yep. did <laughs> Uh, ended up uh, connecting uh, my junior year with uh, an amazing professor who uh, led the audio program, audio engineering program there. Um, and two things, you know, one got into that track and all of a sudden everything made sense and, uh, you know, studying and really learning the background of, of the instrumentation and uh, the acoustic side and, and really formalizing what I already knew, mm -hmm. uh, but putting theory behind it all of a sudden made sense. Um, uh, and I was also uh, a part of the tech team uh, led by that same professor um, and just fell in love with uh, recording really complex things. Mm -hmm. uh, like my first uh, gig that I did was uh, this Middle Eastern uh, 
group with instruments that I'd literally never seen before. And they said, mic these up and figure out how to make it sound good on a recording. Uh, and it was kind of trial by fire. Hmm, um, very cool. And yeah, just fell in love, fell in love with it um, even more so, uh, especially on the technical side. Um, and then uh, graduated from, from Tufts, uh, met my wife there, which was the other giant upside, but graduated <laughs> from Tufts and moved uh, up to Portland, Maine. Um, and was really trying to figure out what to do next, knowing that I, I loved all things audio and, and uh, got connected with this incredible multimedia company that had uh, offices in Portland, but also uh, in California. Um, and over the course of about a year, uh, worked with that company. You know, they knew my background in audio. Uh, they also knew some of the other strengths I had um, sort of on the business leadership side. Uh, and got really lucky uh, to become an owner uh, really early on. So, sorry, as a what owner? Uh, uh, owner of the multimedia company. Oh, got it. Yeah. Um, and so had some incredible partners, uh, mentors, but really from age uh, 23 <laughs> for about a decade, I was uh, heavily focused on both running the business and doing my audio work. Mm. Um, so I think it's the type of thing you can do when you're 25, um, and uh, the work week doesn't have a, a, a limited set of hours um, as much as it does when you're maybe you're 35. Sure. Um, but you know, put in my thousand hours uh, on both the the business uh, running end of things and also the the audio engineering end of things, um, and got really really lucky with that company. Uh, got some new partners. Um, ended up connecting with some incredible brands um you know uh folks like apple um you know other larger brands um and yeah just uh, was able over the course of time to grow the business uh and do less and less of the operational work the kind mm -hmm. of business owner work uh and more of of the audio work which is uh the thing that i'm passionate about that's it's really cool that you know i, I talk to different people and once in a while, I meet someone that has a passion about something from an incredibly early age, and they have like the rare ability to be able to follow that passion for such a long period of time, all the way into their professional life. Yeah, that's incredibly rare. You, you must feel very lucky to. to yeah, to it it, uh, it kind of feels felt unavoidable. Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, as much time as I'd put into growing the business, I'd also have this need to to get out and bring in more audio work. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was not so much a choice. It was just sort of um, built into me. Mm -hmm. Again, again, I blame my dad for that. Uh, but um, yeah, just an incredible opportunity. Um, and, you know, I'm happy I, I jumped on it because it, it sort of brought me to where I am today. Yeah. Where you are today, at least partially, is with the Galileo Project. Yes. So before we delve in exactly how you got involved with that, I want to ask you perhaps a different origin story. Sure, sure. Um, and that's perhaps your interest in the topic of UAP or UFO. When did that start? So that, uh, especially relative to a lot of folks on the Galileo project, is pretty recent. Um, so uh, 2020 um, was kind of a perfect storm. Uh, COVID was going on. Uh, my wife was pregnant with our first kid. Uh, we also decided to get a puppy, uh, all in the course of you know a very short amount of time. Um, and unfortunately, my wife had uh, some complications, uh, which put her in the hospital for, I think it was 55 days wow. in the middle of COVID, oh, COVID with a puppy at home eating our couch. And, Were you uh, able to visit? Yes, but it was really hard uh, where it was, uh, you know, you'd have to check in at multiple security checkpoints. You're always masked up. Um, and I also had obligations at home with a dog. Uh, and I was the only one that could see her. Uh, literally nobody else was wow. able to visit. So uh, that's difficult. It was hard, super hard. Uh, Both of you. Yeah, for sure. Um, rough period, but we got an amazing kid out of it. So, you know, at the end of the day, it was worth it. Um, but you know, over the course of uh, those visits, uh, my wife and I would be talking to each other and um, realized that I needed a distraction. Uh, and uh, I, th I think it was Reddit. I stumbled upon something that happened to uh, to grab my interests. Uh, and I remember saying to, to my wife, I think I'm going to get really into to UFOs. <laughs> 
I'm throwing horrible, myself down the rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, which is a horrible <laughs> thing to say. Uh, not a horrible thing to say. Uh, maybe an alarming thing to say to uh, to your very pregnant uh, wife on bed rest. Looking but, for a little stability. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but it was with an open mind, and it was lighthearted. I knew nothing about the subject. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, grew up growing up, I loved sci-fi. I was really into science, loved space. But for some reason, I'd never pursued or, or looked more into the topic. Um, and so it was kind of a joke. Um, uh, but as soon as I got into it, it was immediately clear to me that there was something really interesting there. Um, you know, namely the New York times articles, uh, really grabbed my attention, you know, hearing stories, uh, from, you know, military aviators, uh, seeing the numbers related to events was, uh, very striking to me. Um, and I did take a, a full study in the course of UAP and, and did go down the rabbit hole and came out the other side, basically saying, um, you know, I'm uncertain, I'm intrigued, I'm open-minded, and I'm really frustrated that there isn't a scientific approach to, to studying this right now. Um, and that was, you know, really where I was uh, a year later uh, when I saw articles about the Galileo Project. Um, and it was like all of a sudden, um, you know, somebody was taking, from the scientific community, was taking this seriously um, and was ready to sort of put their name on the line to say this is something worth studying. Uh, and that was incredibly compelling to me. Um, and so uh, I reached out to Avi uh, kind of on a whim, um, basically saying, hey, this is this is my background. Um, and I think that acoustics should be included in this study if it's going to be holistic. Mm-hmm. Um, not expecting to become a part of the project, uh, but really saying, you know, as you're thinking through what to do, Please make sure you include this in the list of things that um, you know you're 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 thinking about. So let's back up a little bit. Yeah. Um, who so Avi Loeb? Who is Avi Loeb? And from your perspective, what is the Galileo Project? Yep. So uh, Avi Loeb uh, is an astrophysicist at Harvard. Uh, he was the the former chair of the department. Um, very very credentialed. Incredible career. Uh, especially incredible work on black holes. Um, and he. Uh, become known to the the sort of UAP public, I guess, uh, relative to Oumuamua, uh, which was the first interstellar object uh, at the time uh, that had come through the solar system. And, and he had a, a theory um, that 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 it might have been of from extraterrestrial origin. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he got a lot of pushback uh, at the time. Um, and I remember, you know, reading about Avi before I reached out to him and before the Galileo project, um, and thinking that it was just, uh, really sort of brave, uh, to take that on and, and throw out a, a what if hypothesis that, you know, potentially fit the data, um, and, you know, did see some of the pushback, um, but just, you know, grew a, a tremendous admiration for him for, for putting that out there. Even, uh, I feel like in academia, that's, uh, a difficult thing to do um, to uh, sort of push the boundaries of, of uh, what's acceptable and for mm-hmm. hypotheses around things like that. Um, It'd be just to be clear, you know, Avi is in a very respectful position within the Harvard University system. Mm-hmm. So his, his, his support of this topic is, I would say, outsized for um, what we see within the, the rest of academia. So mm-hmm. we, we see a lot of academics express curiosity in this topic Mm -hmm. and not too many people academics professors uh researchers are really taking up the mantle to say hey let's go actually gather data they Mm -hmm. tend to jump to a conclusion about the reality of the situation or not without actually examining any data simply from their own personal observations throughout their own life avi has decidedly moved in a different direction he says let's go find some data and ultimately that's how i interpret what the galileo project is doing and I understand he's doing that through a number of sensors. You're essentially the acoustics subject matter expert, along mm-hmm. with, I would imagine, your other co-lead. Mm-hmm. Is there one or, or multiple co-leads? Uh, one other co-lead. Got it. Um, yeah. And we can talk about that person in a moment. Sure, sure. Um, but what, what are some of the other sensors, before we get further into the acoustics, what other sensors are, are Galileo Project using to examine the sky and look for UAP? Yep. 
so first thing I'll throw out here, uh, one of the, and, and we can maybe talk about it a little bit more later, but uh, one of the things that, that we have produced uh, in these first few years of the project is a paper outlining in great detail. Uh, so if there are any scientifically minded folks that that want to learn more about any of these systems it's all out there it's all we'll, totally we'll transparent that, i'm sure and we can throw yeah, it up that would be Great. wonderful um but yeah it's basically the approach is to look at this multimodally so uh from a multimodal perspective so um we have a a, a an array of infrared cameras, um, which is kind of the central hub for the time being, um, that is looking at the sky 24-7, um, looking in the infrared, uh, using uh, machine learning tools uh, to basically identify something as known or unknown, um, which has taken a tremendous amount of effort uh, to get us to the point where we're at now. Uh, and then that system, uh, along with an all-sky camera, uh, visible all-sky camera, is driving uh, a optical camera with a tremendous zoom on it. So basically, uh, at its simplest, uh, if, if this system sees something interesting that it's categorized as unknown, we can get a high resolution image of it. Um, so that's kind of the, the core, uh, if, if you'll, there's probably a better way to say that, but that's the, the core of the system. Is a, is a photo of the object considered the ultimate goal? A, val a validation or verification? So that's the shorthand, but it, it it's way more complex than that. Um, you know, we are fully aware that uh, this area of study, there are a lot of people who are very skeptical um, and the burden of proof uh, is so high that it can't just be one sensor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, <laughs> to use Avi's uh, parlance, you know, if we got a high resolution image of uh, some sort of craft with a bumper sticker that said, you know, built in Zeta Reticuli, um, I think, you know, there would be pushback from the scientific community. If it was a single sensor, they would say yeah. some cosmic particle bounced off of Starlink and hit the sensor and created some artifact that looks like this object. And unfortunately, um, you know, I think that that would be comforting to a lot of people because uh, it's a difficult idea to wrap your head around that there may be something strange going on. So what we've done is is basically employ the scientific method and say, OK, every instrument needs to be highly calibrated and we need to understand the background. We need to understand how all of those instruments work together. Um, so at the end of the day, if we get an image of something, all of a sudden we have, you know, 10 other sensors that are telling part of the story. Um, so acoustics, for example, um, if we see something, you know, we assume that there's going to be some sort of uh, signature, mm -hmm. uh, acoustic signature related to that thing for showing means of propulsion. Um, you know, a normal aircraft has a signature that you can hear from a certain distance. Um, and if we see something and there's no signature, that's interesting. That's a data point mm -hmm. uh, that you can use relative to all the other sensors. So it really they all work together. Uh, they're separate systems, but at the end of the day, it's one sort of super system um, yeah. to cover all of our bases. Makes sense. Yeah. So let me, uh, let's kind of break that down very quickly and then kind of go into the acoustic side. Yep. Uh, I imagine each kind of detection system, a singular unit has multiple sensors on it. Mm -hmm. And so you're using those multiple sensors in order to um, correlate what any one sensor might be seeing. So even one, one speak, are there multiple speakers or acoustic sensors on a single station? Mm -hmm. Okay. So yep. you could potentially triangulate from a single station and then you could also correlate that with the other instruments on that station. Then what you're suggesting is you would have multiple stations that would be used for a further degree of correlation that would increase the probability of a, of a, of a, you would increase your confidence level in, in what you're seeing to such a degree that it would push back against many scientific skeptics were you to hit something. Yep, exactly. So it's, it's you know, there are multiple levels of that. So the acoustic system, which we can get more into, has three different sensors, all of which overlap. Mm. So there's a, a bit Different of sensors or the same sensors? Different sensor? sensors. Mm. Uh, so they're all working in parallel, uh, but we're able to look at the same chunk of frequency with multiple sensors. So okay. there's that level of, of redundancy. Um, and then there's this whole other element, which is the computing side of the project, which um, really has to do with understanding uh, our background via machine learning. Um, so every, just about every sensor has some form of this. So on the acoustic side, you know, we've trained a machine learning model on 
thousands of aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dom, one of our team members, went through by hand uh, at the first uh, development site that we were at and extracted, I want to say, 400 aircraft manually, which means listening to audio for that oh, long wow. and, and pulling those out. And the idea is to, to give the system a solid understanding of what to expect from uh, aerial signatures. So that's usually, you know, uh, aircraft or helicopters or, uh, you know, we've also added uh, drones to our data. Um, so let me let me ask a question sure, sure. about the machine learning side. And if mm -hmm. if uh, it's not your area of expertise, that's fine. But um, traditional machine learning, I'll say, or really what I think most people would consider um, their expectation of machine learning is to take a bunch of data like you just described mm -hmm. and then um, uh, a human then labels that data to say that is an airplane noise, that is an airplane noise. And um, I would even offer, there's probably a lot of people interested in this topic that would probably volunteer for labeling data. Yeah, um, we'll if, take them. If that's something you guys are looking for. <laughs> yeah. um, it's uh, something we've discussed at Americans for Safe Aerospace as well, right as being on. able to utilize some of, um, some of our membership for things like that. Um, that's typically how machine learning goes. It sounds like that's what you're doing to catalog things that you can see. Mm -hmm. There's a, the inverse of that is utilizing machine learning to detect anomalies, mm -hmm. which is much more difficult because by definition, you're not sure what you're looking for and therefore you can't train a data set yep. to then look for it. Yep. So which of those methods are you guys, uh, is the Galileo project pursuing uh, or, or are you pursuing both of them? Yeah, I, I think uh, we're pursuing both. Um, and I say that because the description that you gave for labeling is exactly what we're doing, at least on the acoustic side. Um, in regards to identifying anomalous signatures or images or whatever the modality is, um, this is outlined much better than I'll be able to describe it in our paper, but um, we've looked at cluster analysis um, for basically if, if most of what you're seeing falls into this cluster, what does an outlier look like and mm -hmm. what is an outlier's relationship to that cluster? Um, so that, I think, comes with getting enough data, getting uh, a variety of data from a variety of locations, a variety of sites, um, and really uh, during the commissioning phase uh, of each of our sites, uh, the idea is to be observing the sky 24-7 to generate enough data to get to that point where we can say confidently by using cluster analysis, this falls outside of the norm. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of a, a dual track, I guess. Um, yeah. Is there a geographical distribution on where the sensors are located and what you consider an outlier? Um, or geographical categorization, perhaps, or cohort, where you might see a particular object, you know, the definition of an outlier might be different in, say, you know, southern Florida, as it might be in Seattle. Yeah, yeah that's a great question. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. Um, right now, we've been so focused on the two development sites, uh, one in Massachusetts and one in Colorado. Um, in learning the backgrounds and what's normal for those locations. But yes, uh, part of the commissioning phase for any observatory that we put up is really understanding what to expect in that location. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be location specific. So uh, for acoustics, it could be, it could be birds. Uh, yeah. It could be, you know, the Seasonal type of, birds, yeah. exactly the type of aircraft that we expect to see. Um, you know, even uh, our expectations in the background. Um, so that's one of the things that's really critical um, on the acoustic side, because in, in making a determination on whether we should hear something, mm -hmm. we need to really understand the background first. Mm -hmm. um, it's a similar problem that, that you know, we, we had in the jet essentially, where we had a new sensor that we were seeing something and yep. we didn't know what it was, but we didn't know who else could see it. Right. Um, and in a, in a way, it's, it's a very similar problem. I, I know Avi and the Galileo Project has expressed um, at least the, the financial need to be able to distribute these to multiple mm -hmm. places. So I imagine um, within obvious long-term strategy, it would include a well-dispersed uh, sensor network that yep. would eliminate um, observation bias to the degree we can, right? And then, you know, the argument, I guess, would be, it's, well, it's only the continental United States right. or it's only the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> totally. Right? So, I mean, at a certain point, you have to draw a line and, and draw a conclusion, but uh, I can see how what you guys are proposing could scale into something that would eliminate that observation bias to a high degree of confidence. Um, perhaps you could talk a little bit more about the specifics of the audio system and sure. how it operates. Sure, sure. So uh, coming into the project, uh, the, the, <laughs> the audio goals were very simple, which was just let's include 
acoustics in the study. Um, and there were a couple of reasons for that. Um, you know, one was just knowing the, the literature. There were objects traveling faster than the speed of sound with no sonic boom. So at the very least, can you get a microphone up to say, if we saw something, it moved faster than the speed of sound. We didn't hear anything. That's interesting. Hmm. Um, and then as we... With a, with a visual sensor or some other sensor, sensor correlated. Yeah, yep. exactly. Um, so it's it was... At the start, as much uh, what we don't hear <laughs> as what we do hear. Mm -hmm. That was interesting to us. Um, and then, you know, throughout the process of, of engaging more with the, the scientific team, really looking at, um, you know, what's possible to detect um, in a variety of, of bands, we realized that we needed to uh, potentially expand beyond human hearing. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, again, going back to that, you know, one of the most interesting things to hear is nothing. Um, when you expect to hear some means of propulsion from an object, you know, half a kilometer away, but you don't hear anything that's interesting. Well, it could be that it's above human hearing or below human hearing. Uh, so very quickly we said, okay, we need to cover, uh, 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz, which is human hearing, but we also need to go above human hearing, uh, to ultrasound and below human hearing to infrasound. Now would... Infra and ultrasound sensors uh, provide additional detail on objects that are perhaps far away. So, you know, mm -hmm. I'll be honest, I haven't thought about sound, you know, first mm -hmm. principles in a while. But, you know, we, we picture an object moving through the air. And I think when we discuss assumptions that uh, the Galileo Project is making, it's assuming that these objects are behaving in the atmosphere much like a normal aircraft. So mm -hmm. it would move air out of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and by doing that, that would then create a small pressure wave. Mm -hmm. Uh, or a large pressure wave, right? Yep. Um, would that pressure wave decrease over time, and would that cause the frequency to uh, decrease? Yep. So, if, yep. Okay. So that's yeah, that's a critical part of of uh, of the acoustic side of the project is is understanding that. So basically, there are two ways that sound can decrease in power over distance. One is is basically the inverse square law mm -hmm. that affects uh, all frequencies the same. Um, the other is uh, atmospheric absorption coefficients. Yeah. Um, so basically, the maximum range. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, highest end ultrasound is oscillating really quickly. Uh, like the top end of our system is 190 kilohertz. That's it's moving 190,000 times a second. Mm -hmm. uh, naturally, that's going to expel more energy uh, as it's moving quickly. So the higher the frequency basically the, the shorter distance it can travel. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very much aware that, you know, the top end of our system, if we're hearing something up there, something very strange is going on. Mm -hmm. um, so we would immediately look to what's in our local environment before attributing that to, you know, basically violating the laws of physics. Is there is there a maximum um, ultrasound that, um, that you can see within the, the this type of atmosphere, the parameters of this atmosphere, or would it, just simply have zero proper propagation distance, and therefore you could rule out anything above a certain frequency. Yeah, it's it's basically it's going to fall below at at any reasonable distance. Ultrasound is going to be below the noise floor, um, uh, without saying exactly what that distance is. But it's it you know it could be meters. Hmm. Um, so again, it's it's highly unlikely that we grab anything up there. But one of the the goals of the project is to cast a wide net. You can, almost, you can bound the problem though pretty well, at least from a range problem with with these microphones. It sounds like based Absolutely. off of yeah, the yeah. frequency you're getting. Um, and with uh, we've been really lucky throughout the project that um, a lot of sort of manufacturers uh, have been open to chatting with with us and collaborating. And uh, Wildlife Acoustics uh, is the company that that makes our ultrasonic system. Um, it's primarily used for bat detection because uh, bats, uh, you know, uh, make noise in the ultrasound. And I asked the lead engineer uh, how often he's gotten uh, 190 kilohertz signals, and he basically said, "If the if the bat is uh, less than an inch away from the microphone, you might get something." Interesting. Uh, so it's it's incredibly wide, but again, that that goes back to the the project ethos of the wide net. Um, ultra or infrasound, uh, on the other hand, uh, can travel tremendous distances. So uh, the lowest end of our system is 0 0.05 hertz. Mm. Um, and uh, when Avi initially heard that, uh, this was early on, he did the math in his head and calculated the, the it's a miles and miles That's long. That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah, how yeah. long is the, the trough? Uh, I would need Many to, miles, I but I think it's like six miles. I'm not uh, as quick at math as yeah. Avi is. But. So, I mean, the wave, you know, 
know, for people that maybe not following, we have our, our, our wave, energy wave, essentially, or frequency, and it's such a low frequency that one wave takes essentially miles, right? Yep. So it's hard to detect those frequencies. You need large antennas, is my understanding. Yeah, we our sensor uh, is actually pretty compact, but we're using it in conjunction with a network of infrasonic sensors. So we need, want to make sure that what we're hearing isn't local um, and that it is something that's, that's traveling long distances and, and is hitting multiple sensors. But... That's kind of the beauty of, of infrasound. Uh, it's why it's used for things like meteor detection uh, or even uh, melting uh, ice shelves. Uh, when they rub against each other, mm. they make these um, you know, really low infrasonic sounds that can travel significant distances. Um, and I was, I was really happy when Avi asked that question when he kind of threw out, like, that seems ridiculous, that the length of that uh, waveform um, down to 0 0.05 hertz. Uh, I had just uh, been working with my co-lead on justifying our system. Uh, and there are things called gravity waves, which are mm -hmm. different from gravitational waves. Okay. Um, maybe, which, maybe you lost me. Yeah, can you explain the difference? Yeah, wh which uh, gravitational waves are, uh, you know, I'm stepping outside of my expertise here, but, uh, you know, basically ripples in space time. Mm -hmm. Uh, gravity waves uh, have to do with the atmosphere and, and air uh, pushing it, getting being pushed by gravity. It was a terrible description, but essentially uh, it can create these really, really, really low frequency waves. Um, and it's a known phenomenon. With the atmosphere itself is yes. creating. Wow, that's very interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. Um, and there was actually a, a recent study that found some strange infrasonic uh, signals in the atmosphere, uh, mm -hmm. and I haven't followed up on it, but uh, I think the, the Acoustic Society of America was working on a study about it, so mm -hmm. um, probably should have looked that up before, but yeah, there's infrasound is fascinating, um, if anything, because it can, you know, project really important information over long distances. Um, so yeah, it's, it's basically our system scaled up from being just a, a single sensor. We're only worried about sound pressure level overall, you know, did we hear a loud sound for a sonic boom? Uh, and then we moved into the frequency spectrum of, okay, well, uh, as you were saying, you know, higher sounds are not going to propagate as far. So if we're looking at aircraft, we're probably looking at 100 hertz to 500 hertz because at a kilometer away, that's all that's left. Mm. Uh, the higher frequency has been absorbed by the atmosphere. Um, and then the natural evolution to uh, infrasound and, and ultrasound. Uh, and that's where we kind of landed uh, for the paper that we published, which outlined our methodology for our phase 1.0 system. Um, and so, yeah, the idea is we're running 24-7. So the, before you, before yeah. you w w so the methodology, this is a, an acoustic detection or, or monitoring yep. protocol. Maybe just provide a little context around like exactly what like an op the operation looks like on a regular yep. basis, perhaps. Yeah. So uh, we, we call the system uh, AMOS. It's the Acoustic Monitoring Omnidirectional System because uh, none of our sensors are directional. They're, they're taking in sound equally from all directions. And before you go into that, and perhaps we can start that again in a moment, sure, sure. but um, we're going to be going on site. Yes. I'm very excited. We're going to be going on site to take a look at this system, I think for the first time yep. in operation, maybe we'll get a hit. Yeah, uh, you never know. <laughs> yeah, so this is very exciting. That'll be coming up. So, um, yeah, let's hear about the system now, and then we'll uh, sure, sure. we'll cut to that. Perfect. Um, yeah, so uh, AMOS, the Acoustic Monitoring Omnidirectional System, uh, is uh, those three sensors. Uh, it's an audible sensor. Um, it is an ultrasonic sensor and an infrasonic sensor. Um, and these are running continuously, 24-7. Um, so one of the, the design requirements, um, going back to that paper, um, that mapped out basically this needs to be a rugged system that's self-sustaining. Um, so, you know, if we lose power, it needs to know how to turn back on and start recording again if it's in a remote location. Uh, it needs to be weatherized, uh, which was a surprisingly hard challenge um, where I guess most people don't uh, build their, their microphones to uh, take torrential downpours um, on the regular. So, um, you know, we had to get creative. Luckily, we found some great off-the-shelf sensors to put the system together that, that met those criteria. Uh, but we have a very, very rugged uh, tower that um, Alex, our, our designer, built that can withstand uh, hurricane force winds. Um, and uh, yeah, we're running 24-7. Uh, that data is being pushed to the cloud. Um, the data uh, 
amount of data is also a challenge, um, which anybody from the optical side is going to laugh at me because uh, the acoustics uh, use of data is, you know, pales in comparison to, to the other systems. But uh, our ultrasonic system is generating uh, about 90 gigabytes a day. Oh, yeah. That's um, significant. Yeah, it's significant. Uh, Audible is uh, about 10 gigabytes a day. Uh, and then infrasound is 10 megabytes. Oh, wow. Uh, and that has to do with sampling rate. So you want basically how many times you're looking at the data to be double the highest frequency that you want to capture, which means the sample rate for uh, ultrasound is really, really high. The Can you say those rate. numbers again? It's really cool, but in perspective, like how much data requires to yeah, capture yeah. that wave. Yeah, yeah. So uh, ultrasound uh, is about uh, 90 gigabytes uh, per day. Um, Audible is about 10 gigabytes per day. Oh. Um, and then infrasound is about 10 megabytes. 10 megabytes, that's crazy. Yeah, which is, big difference. Yeah, big difference. Uh, but we're getting what we need at full resolution out of all of the systems uh, because of the sample rate um, needing to be double. Um, so, you know, data is a challenge. We have a whole computing team dedicated to solving that data challenge. Um, some brilliant, brilliant people coming up with incredible solutions for, you know, edge computing and then pushing that data to the cloud uh, when relevant and then, you know, doing local storage. Uh, but that is, you know, not an insignificant part of the, the challenge in designing a system like this is how do you handle that? Yeah. What are your constraints? What, what's kind of stopping this from... Uh, moving forward faster with better sensors, is it a money issue? Is it a technology issue? Is it a time issue? What, what, where are the constraints and what's happening right now at the Galileo yeah, project? That's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, coming from industry, uh, one of the, the most interesting parts of being part of a scientific project, and this is where my co-lead, who is, you know, a PhD from MIT, super solid science background, has hammered this into me. <laughs> but uh, in industry, oftentimes results are all that matters. Uh, it's, can you deliver this thing to spec? Uh, does it work? Uh, and then it's, you know, we don't want to know how the sausage was made. Yeah. Uh, and then with a scientific project like this, you know, process is as important as results. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, not only do you want to know how the sausage was made, you want to know where the casing came from and why did you decide to use that casing for the sausage? <laughs> um, and it's because, you know, you want your study to be recreatable. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want, we basically want to be able to hand our paper to somebody and have them go out and do what we're doing. We also want to make sure that we have uh, our process dialed. We know that there are going to be a lot of eyes on this project, uh, given sort of the subject matter. A mm -hmm. lot of people are going to be critical, and we need to make sure that our process is bulletproof. Um, so, you know, we're taking our time um you know we're moving as fast as we can but we're taking the time to make sure that the process is correct those decisions that go into every element down to the cabling that we're using are thought out uh, so we can defend uh, in the future if if we do publish something um, but then it's also calibration um, and that's something that you know is is uh so critical in that if we publish a paper and there's a reasonable objection that we're, we're haven't calibrated the background or haven't calibrated the instrumentation itself that puts into question the results um so you know uh, coming from industry i do have that uh that urge to push forward faster mm -hmm. and break things and and it's it's just not worth it on a scientific project like this mm -hmm. where you know we kind of feel like we're going to get one shot if we get something, um, and we want to make sure that there are no there are no questions about our process. So, I would say the biggest thing uh, in regards to you know timing and and why we haven't published anything yet comes down to getting the science right, mm -hmm. um, and that just takes time. Um, and so, you know, we're going to go to the site later, and uh, the the infrared system that I was mentioning before isn't going to be there. It's at Harvard right now because uh, we just replaced the windows because our designer came up with a better way to do this, and he is going through and recalibrating every camera for the umpteenth time. Right. Um, is the Galileo project looking to leverage any of the techniques or potentially technology or algorithms that you guys develop for other commercial purposes? Um, not really. Like there, there are some things that, uh, we might just happen to catch. Uh, like I was just, uh, chatting with Avi about, um, there's this phenomena, 
uh, called uh, photoelectric sound uh, with meteors, where uh, a certain percentage of meteors, and it's pretty low, this is part of what I'm talking to Avi about, um, have simultaneous sound uh, with a flash. So if something's, you know, way up in the atmosphere, it should take minutes <laughs> to reach you if it's making a sound. Um, and there's this known, you know, going back to the 1800s, there have been all of these sightings uh, where people see something and hear something at the same time. That's fascinating. Um, and there's only been one, uh, to the best of my knowledge, one known recording of, of that ever. Like and video, audio? Yep. Interesting. Um, and so that's because, you know, who's going to point a camera at the sky all the time and <laughs> record sound all the time? And it's like, well, we happen to have that system uh, that could potentially capture something like that. Um, so right now, you know, it's that's just a kind of a passing thought and there's nothing formal about it yet. But, you know, that's the type of thing where there might be other phenomena, you know, outside of that that we end up passively capturing. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, out, there's no uh, specific uh, goals outside of our immediate mission, which is to capture a photo of a UAP. Um, but there might maybe other applications that kind of passively happen, mm -hmm. uh, which would be cool. What other constraints does a Galileo project have? So, uh, you know, funding uh, is definitely something that we uh, unfortunately talk a lot about. Um, and we're in a tricky position uh, where we're privately funded. Um, so one thing I, I don't think a lot of people understand is, yes, we're a Harvard program, but Harvard we don't have any, we receive any funding from mm -hmm. them. Um, but luckily we have some incredible donors, uh, both kind of large and small, um, who've said, yes, this is important. Um, and yes, we'll, we'll back this, but that isn't gonna last forever. Um, and we're continuously thinking, you know, a year in the future, five years in the future, um, knowing that part of the success of the project might come down to how many of these systems that we can put up. Um, so a lot of uh, the funding, uh, immediate funding uh, that we had has gone into this, these development sites, uh, you know, refining our process and looking at, you know, potentially putting up five initial sites. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, a matter of, uh, you know, if you can get five systems, that's one thing. If you can get 100 systems, that's another thing. Um, and I think, you know, I try to avoid uh, social media um, around this topic. Uh, I, I'm a relatively sensitive person. So, uh, you know, going down the rabbit holes of Twitter or Reddit is, is difficult. But one of the things that's frustrating to me, especially in regards to this project and talking about funding, um, is one, the Harvard Association of you guys must have unlimited money um, and two uh, you know anytime an ask comes up for funding talking about oh it must be a grift mm -hmm. uh, which is a word thrown around a lot related to this topic um, and being on the inside of it it's especially frustrating for me where you know I'm a volunteer uh, the vast majority of people on the project are volunteers mm -hmm. uh, and these are all people who are experts in their field um, there are a few uh, paid staff members just because of the nature of the position. They have to be full time or the expertise. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, our funding is going primarily to instrumentation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I kind of chuckle when I, I see people say, you know, hints that there's a grift or like a money making opportunity here where it's like, definitely the vast majority of the folks donating their time are not yeah. uh, that's how feeling that. that's how a scientific effort to move forward in this country i mean yeah. you need resources you need tools to be able to gather data yep. uh, i see when when people overly attack you know people looking to move the conversation forward in scientific and reasonable ways yep. and people attack them as a grift that that is just for me it seems like a, a gatekeeping trying to gatekeep it and relegate it as a hobby versus something that's professionally looked into and I, that's not what this field needs right now. This field 100%. needs data. It needs investment so that we can determine one way or another what's 100%. going on in our skies. A hundred percent. And it's, it's uh, you know, that's uh, one of the scariest things to me thinking about, you know, what happens if, um, you know, there isn't additional funding in the field uh, and these studies can't happen. Does it mean we're on pause for another 10 years before, you know, maybe interest spikes again? Um, when, you know, we can talk about this, uh, you know, in more detail, but a giant part of our paper, uh, the main paper, uh, uh, Wes Waters was the lead author, is 
creating a solid peer-reviewed scientific justification for why this should be studied. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think at the end of the day, you know, say we don't get funded and, and uh, that would be heartbreaking and uh, for so many reasons, but at the end of the day, one thing that paper did is give you know future groups really really solid ground to stand on to say this is why this is worth studying um here's some historical background and and reference for why anomalous things are worth looking into um at this point you know it might not be peer-reviewed it might not be multimodal studies but there's enough evidence to say let's take a look at this um and you know the level of funding needed for the field relative to you know other scientific endeavors is so low uh, yeah. comparatively when you're talking about you know the james webb telescope or you know mm-hmm. large large projects um so yeah it's it's just a matter um of our team will continue to do the work and volunteer our time uh and just hope that uh there are enough folks out there um you know individuals or groups uh that that see value in taking a rigorous scientific approach mm-hmm. to something like this i don't think people really understand at least I know certain people very much understand and appreciate this, but others don't fully understand how unique of a position I believe we're in right now. Mm -hmm. This conversation has been stigmatized so much historically, and there's a lot of, a a lot of uh, baggage and associations that come up with this conversation. Mm -hmm. And we've moved the ball forward. When I say we, I mean the general public, the government, Department of Defense, even they've moved the ball forward and they've acknowledged in every way they can that there are things that we don't understand in our sky. And to your point, if we are not able to keep the conversation going in this this point where stigma has been reduced, there is a fear that it could come back Mm -hmm. and the conversation just gets ridiculed and it gets ignored and we move on Mm -hmm. and we delay this conversation perhaps for however long we delay it. 100%. And and again, to go back to the paper, uh, which I'm really pushing uh, because I think it's really, really important uh, and I don't know if it created as much of a a wave as as we'd hoped, Um, you know, the foundation is there. That's that's something to have in your back pocket if people are pushing back on on why this should be studied. Like uh, we go into uh, Thomas Kuhn, who's a who's a uh, philosopher of science. Um, I think Abby talked about this a little bit with you, but this idea of a paradigm uh, and then, you know, a crisis coming up and then a revolution. And I know that people are, uh, you know, Kuhn is not uh, the coolest thing these days, but that was a, a, a helpful framework for us in establishing what was anomalous. Um, the other thing related to that, uh, that that we pulled from in the paper was uh, Kierkegaard talking about the two ways to be fooled, where uh, the first way to be fooled is uh, to believe in something that isn't true, uh, right? So uh, the canals on Mars uh, are the example that mm-hmm. we used for this, where, uh, you know, there are folks looking through telescopes and, and thought they saw, you know, rivers, canals on Mars. Uh, it turns out it was an optical illusion that had to do with the eye, I think. Uh, they were actually seeing part of their eye. Uh, the second way to be fooled is to uh, basically not believe in something that is true. Mm-hmm. Um, and the best example of this uh, that, that we pulled in the paper uh, was you know, pre-1800, uh, there were lots of reports of rocks falling from the sky. Um, and people were very skeptical. Uh, the scientists of sounds the day, ridiculous, frankly. Yeah, it sounds insane. Uh, <laughs> and people were ridiculed and said, you know, and we're told that's crazy. That literally couldn't happen. Um, to the point where a, a famous uh, French chemist uh, published a paper talking about how ridiculous it was. Uh, and then there was a tipping point in the early 1800s where a bunch of people saw a meteorite. Uh, and there was a physicist who uh, went down and interviewed those folks, and they were credible observers. Uh, and he said to the scientific community, hey, I think there's something here. They didn't have any sensor data? Yeah, apparently not. I don't understand yeah, how they were able to reach they a conclusion. Doing, they weren't doing a study for that. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, that took time uh to get there and it took somebody you know courage of of people to you know stick by and say i know what i saw yeah um and so you know if there's anything to be hopeful about it's that you know the the course of science there are those moments there are uh things outside of the paradigm and ultimately they get pulled in and and made sense of uh in you know kind of known physics um but it yeah, it, it takes time and, and can be frustrating, especially if you're one of those people who saw the meteorites and, and mm-hmm. you know, everybody kind of shrugged their shoulders at you. Exactly. 
Do you have any personal experience with anomalous detections or what we call UAP? Uh, so yes and no. <laughs> um, so uh, prior to the Galileo project, zero. Um, you know, it's I know a lot of folks uh, get interested in the field because they've seen something and they want to learn more about it. Uh, but uh, I was uh, at an outdoor concert. Uh, my brother-in-law was a huge fan of this band um, and uh, entered a raffle uh, and we won the raffle. So we were literally the first two people into this stadium. Um, so we walked all the way up to the front uh, and we're standing right at the front, right in front of the band. Uh, I'm six foot five. Uh, so I was super self-conscious that I was blocking everybody's view. You are. I was. <laughs> uh, I'm officially that guy at every concert. Uh, so I was hunkered down on the barrier, uh, trying to be respectful of the people sure. behind me. But by the time the band took a set break, uh, my neck and back felt awful. Uh, so I sat down uh, on the, the barrier and was kind of stretching and, and looked up uh, and saw what at first thought was Jupiter, uh, sort of this bright orange glowing object. Um, and then it's, it was moving, um, and it was moving really slowly. So I do a fair amount of stargazing, so I'm decent at spotting satellites, and it was moving infinitely slower than a satellite. Um, <clears throat> and it, it, you know, flew over, uh, it, it moved continuously, it didn't do any stopping. Um, and so, you know, now, putting on my scientific hat, you know, it's probably not the best place to look for a UAP is at a concert where, you know, there could be balloons, there could mm -hmm. be drones. So uh, that's why I sort of said yes and no, uh, where in that moment, uh, I couldn't identify what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a very, uh, I, there was an experience where I, I, I basically said uh, very loudly, look, it's a UFO. Nobody turned around. Nobody no one, said right? nobody, literally nobody. Um, and in that moment, it just kind of struck me of like, wow, okay, this is, you know, something I'm having a moment, you know, not knowing what this thing is. I assumed that other people would be very interested in it. Mm -hmm. And then that, uh, that didn't happen and didn't it translate, it didn't translate yeah. and who knows what it was. Um, but at the end of the day, that gave me more, even more empathy uh, for people who've seen something mm -hmm. and try to tell somebody else about it or feel that stigma that they can't say anything about it. Um, and it, it made me even happier that I was a part of the Galileo Project where we're saying this is worth studying. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's, it's hard to say scientifically uh, without really, really uh, intense uh, data and evidence, you know, um, I believe you. But it feels like there's a parallel there where we say uh, we're saying there's something here to study. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you feel like uh, you've seen something and haven't been listened to, uh, it feels cool that we're able to do something about that um, scientifically. Absolutely. You know, I've been a lot of pilots been reaching out to me at safeaerospace.org. Uh, we've been re receiving uh, reports by email, though we're standing up an official process and, and procedure for uh, commercial aviators to be able to report and not only report, but then see kind of where these hotspots are uh, for these objects. One thing that certainly raised, I think, the noise floor to some degree is uh, all the traffic that's in low Earth orbit now. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you guys have any specific lines of effort or anything to uh, mitigate those type of um, observations or detections? That's a great question. Um, I think if our systems work uh, the way we want them to work, uh, those sort of uh, standard things that we'll see in low Earth orbit will become part of the background. They'll mm -hmm. become part of the known uh, set of things. So in theory, we can rule them out. Uh, but that just takes time, that takes data, uh, and it takes uh, refinement of the machine learning model. Uh, but that's a serious challenge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd put that right up there with uh, how easy uh, you know, it's going to be with generative AI to create uh, fakes. Yeah. So it's, um, I think in the coming years, we're going to see uh, sort of spaces flooded with a lot of things. Uh, the, the noise ratio is going to go up even further, mm -hmm. uh, be it, you know, natural new developments in our atmosphere uh, or new tools. Uh, and that's part of why um, we think it's really critical to do this now <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, before it gets noisier. Yeah. The, uh, my last episode, well, maybe the one before the last that airs, was with my co-chair at the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. 
um, Michael Lembeck, Dr. Michael Lembeck. And one of the things that we've been talking about recently standing up is a, is a particular effort where we're going to be looking to write papers on what exactly Starlink should look like, because mm -hmm. pilots are seeing a lot of things, whether they're UAP or they're being Starlink, mm -hmm. either way, they're a distraction in the cockpit yes. for pilots. And so um, we're looking to better um, define what, what those parameters are for perhaps people that are seeing Starlink at different grazing angles than someone on the ground where mm -hmm. the primary uh, mitigation of refracted light from the sun is targeted, right? So they're mm -hmm. not really targeting, you know, perhaps the angle is, is such that it allows pilots to see the reflection of the sunlight, but not people on the ground. Right. right? And so there, there might be a disconnect there. And that's one of the efforts that uh, we're starting up now at the, at the UAP integration committee is to better understand uh, that problem. As promised, we're going to head uh, to the, to the development site in order to see one of these uh, sensor packages uh, in operation. Uh, what can you tell us about what we're going to see when we get there? Sure. So uh, first, the name of the site, uh, the code name is Pigeon Run. Oh, uh, Pigeon we do, uh, there are some concerns around security. Um, just, we really respect the folks who are letting us uh, set up our equipment there, mm -hmm. and we don't want to disclose where that is for that reason. That's, that's literally it. Uh, everything that's out there is in our paper, uh, fully transparent. Uh, it's just a matter of, um, yeah, not wanting to divulge location, but uh, it's in a beautiful part of Massachusetts. Uh, we're going to drive down a, a long, long dirt road uh, and turn the corner, uh, and then you'll see all the instrumentation. So we have towers. There's a passive radar tower. Uh, we have Beacon, which is our optical camera, um, and then a, a handful of other sensors, Pac-Man, which is a weather sensor, Spectre, which is another radar system, uh, and then... Uh, the infrared system, which I described, will not be there because mm -hmm. we're calibrating it, uh, our all-sky camera, and then our acoustic system. Um, so it's all spaced out. Uh, we're, we keep them relatively close in that the central uh, computer processing needs to be accessible to all the instrumentation. So relatively small footprint for what we're doing. Um, but yeah, uh, on the acoustic side, uh, we'll see uh, the tower that I described, uh, and then something else that we're going to show today, which... Uh, this is sort of coming from my industry uh, side of things. We're going to show an in-progress uh, acoustic system. Uh, so as we've refined and calibrated our existing systems, we've also talked about upgrades. Um, and this is happening for all systems. It's kind of a parallel process. So the uh, we call the initial system that we described in our acoustics paper phase 1.0. Uh, the system that I'm going to show today is phase 1.5. Uh, the biggest difference being that we're moving from an omnidirectional system to a directional system. Hmm. Um, and so uh, my scientific colleagues might flinch uh, in me uh, talking about this midstream versus publishing a paper on it. Uh, but ultimately, it's a good snapshot of um, where the, the next phase of the project is going for acoustics. And that's to be able to determine where a sound is coming from. Uh, so to do that, we're using a, a series of microphones um, that basically as the sound waves hit the microphones, we're cross-correlating those and saying, okay, if it hit this microphone at this time and this microphone at this time, et cetera, et cetera, it must come from that direction. Got it. Uh, with the end goal being to uh, actually localize uh, with an array of, of microphones. So uh, we have the, or a cluster of arrays of microphones. Um, so basically, if we can point from this microphone array and point from this microphone, on an array, we can start to actually triangulate where the sound is coming from. Sweet. Well, let's go check it out. Let's do it. All right, Andy, we are on on location with some of the sensors here, the Galileo project. I'm going to throw it over to you and let's do a little walk around about what you have going on here. Perfect. So, yeah, we are here at Pigeon Run, the Galileo development site. Uh, and so we can start over here. Uh, this is the main platform. Uh, rough data to be out here because, like I said before, uh, the Dalek, which is our infrared uh, hemisphere, array uh, is currently being calibrated. Maybe just, would you mind telling me a little bit about your background real quick and then before you tell us about this? Sure, well, I've been um, a mechanical engineer at Caltech for 13 years. I designed uh, optical instrument for astrophysics and uh, that actually helped me to build the instruments for the Galileo project. Very good. Um, what are we looking at here? Hey, we're looking at the infrared camera array. We have uh, seven FLIR cameras peripheral, one uh, Zenit camera, bosons, they're all bosons in infrared, and a uh, near-infrared camera, all sky. When you say zenith camera, is that a type of camera, or is that just a... Yeah, it's just looking up directly up. Yeah. 
And you're doing, are you doing compute on this device itself or is that going into that? Right. So this is the detecting instruments. All those cameras are monitoring the sky and uh, the uh, computer is uh, figuring out if it sees something that's unusual and then relay that information to the uh, tracking camera that's going to follow the object. Is any sensor considered a primary sensor that can then be correlated with something else? Or do you have primary sensors and others are used for correlation? This is actually a primary sensor. This is the primary sensor. Yes. Yeah. So that's why when all the cameras, well, actually four of the cameras are out for calibration uh, uh, so that we have a, a good uh, understanding of the temperature that we're receiving from the object and we can qualify and quantify exactly the, the data we're collecting. Very cool. These look like windshield wipers. Is that what they yes, are? they are both actually. They are shades because those cameras are sensitive to direct sunlight. So the, the face that is exposed uh, to the sun is going to hide them. And the other side is a brush that keeps the, the landscape. Actually, uh, just change the windows on, on the dome and do, doing the rewiring. Uh, so so the those, are, yeah, this are, those are brand new uh, windows. And to keep them clean, those brushes, once in a while, give it a little bit of, uh, of a brushing. When it's snowing, it's very interesting to be able to see something. Awesome. Well, very good. Thank you so much uh, for sure. explaining. You're welcome, Brad. This is the Alcor, uh, which is an all-sky camera, which works in conjunction uh, with the Dalek. Uh, so basically, you know, all-sky, 24-7 between infrared uh, and optical. Um, and then moving across here, uh, so the Dalek over here drives that camera up there, the beacon, uh, which that is uh, a high resolution optical camera with a really serious zoom. Uh, so the idea is we spot something over here, we determine it's anomalous, uh, and then that pushes information to that camera to be able to track it. Um, so that's our primary camera sensor as of now, visual. Yep. Um, so uh, not to underplay data, uh, this is our Starlink. Uh, so we have a couple of different approaches for data. Uh, Starlink being one of them, obviously in remote locations, uh, really helpful to be able to go to a satellite versus depending on, uh, versus relying on, you know, local cell networks because they may not be around where we are. And I understand that you guys are trying to reduce the amount of data you probably send out uh, that comes from the edge, mm -hmm. right? utilizing what we call uh, on the edge type machine. Processing. To, yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, uh, the data loads are incredible between all of the instruments uh, and any sort of processing and filtering that we can do on site helps us with uh, the amount of overall data we need to push out. Obviously, we're saving everything. So if we do need to get a year's worth of data, we want to be able to come down locally and pull it. But we're not necessarily pushing all of that to the cloud just to be economical on data. I wonder sure. what the market is like for... Um... Uh, ASIC type chip for machine learning on the edge. I feel like that might be a pretty good market, especially when you consider like the space economy. Yep, absolutely. And and uh, our computing team is is super dialed and has looked at so many options. Uh, and right now we're running with uh, NVIDIA architecture. Uh, and I've been working with them uh, pretty closely to, to come up with uh, an ideal solution. And that's part of the process is evolving what we're using. So this is one part of our passive radar system uh, with the idea being that you can't really use an active radar system uh, as a civilian. Um, there are some marine radars, but obviously, you know, blasting out signal is not ideal. This doesn't put out any signal. Uh, instead, it uses FM reflection. Um, so the idea is uh, we can have a series of these towers uh, spaced out uh, across pretty serious distances uh, and be able to tell kinematics uh, by looking at the reflections um, and ultimately, yeah, say, is that a real object? This is going to be a key instrument in doing that. You know, the uh, ability to say there's definitively an object there, how fast it's moving, how far away it is um, with as many systems as possible is really key. Uh, and this is kind of the core of that challenge. Very cool. Yep. There we go. No time tracking data. Yeah. We should hit record on that system and localize it. And that's essentially what we're talking about as we move over to the audio side here. Is yes. Here on an airplane, we're seeing an aircraft. Yep. And your system theoretically would be able to geolocate and tell where it is in three dimensions. Exactly. And I think, uh, you know, an experiment for anybody listening is to go outside, uh, listen for an aircraft, look up and try to find it. And it's incredibly hard. Uh, and that's, you know, the delay given the speed of sound. Uh, you know, it's 
at a kilometer. Uh, I don't know that off the top. I think it's like 1.9 seconds or something like that. Uh, so there is a delay. So oftentimes you'll listen, try to localize yourself, sound like it's coming from over there, and then you look up and it's over there. So our system needs to take that into account, uh, the speed of sound delay uh, relative to what we're seeing visually. Uh, they're kind of a back and forth where you have your initial data that gives you some estimate of the altitude and then you're able to triangulate that and sweeten it up as you go. So it's actually with, uh, and I should say this is in development right now, uh, so this is subject to change, but right now the idea is we have uh, pretty, pretty serious pointing capabilities uh, where we can say, you know, it's coming from there. There doesn't include a distance, um, but as soon as we have two of those arrays, all of a sudden we can start to pull in distance. We're also looking at uh, using multiple systems, potentially the visual system, to say uh, if we know that it was the sound was uh, coming from there, we can potentially look back in time at when the visual matched up with that. That could give us distance information. So we're trying to look at how uh, accurate we can get with that approach. Uh, so this is actually incredibly important uh, to acoustics. Uh, this is Pac-Man. Uh, this is essentially a weather station. Um, so you can see that we're looking at wind speed. Um, uh, there's a magnetometer, uh, although we are going to have a separate magnetometer. But essentially, this is giving us immediate conditions, and it's very close to the uh, the Amos Tower, um, and that's really helpful. Uh, you know, determining the speed of sound. There are lots of factors that uh, play into that that have to do with uh, weather, temperature, pressure, um, and this gives us a point of reference for local conditions. And then we have other tools that we can potentially use uh, for up in the sky. Uh, so between those two things, we have a pretty good sense of you know what the speed of sound should be. This is part of the acoustics team responsibility here? It is not. We just happen to benefit from Got it. Uh, and so uh, we are very happy that it is near our tower. Yeah. So this is Amos, uh, the acoustic monitoring omnidirectional system. Uh, so up at the top, uh, we have our audible sensor. Uh, this is, again, like we talked about, really rugged outdoor, uh, high-end, scientific-grade uh, microphone. Um, so It looks it, a lot like a foamy thing kind of just stuck down on a silver bullet. A little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. Is, is that is that silver structure, the microphone itself, and you put a condenser down over it? Uh, so that's actually to mitigate uh, wind. Uh, so it's a windscreen. Yeah, it's basically a foam windscreen, uh, and it's sitting over the top of the capsule of the microphone. So it actually uh, looks even more sort of like a bullet once you take it all apart. Um, but it uh, really, yeah, it's it's sort of the central part of the system uh, in that it's covering the whole range of human hearing. Um, maybe some changes in phase 1.5 relative to that uh, sensor, but uh, it's held up incredibly well uh, for the 10 months that we've been deployed. Uh, so... Pivoting over to the side here, uh, this is our ultrasonic microphone. Um, and so this is the capture device here uh, that goes from 10 kilohertz to 190 kilohertz, so way above human hearing. Uh, and, and this is uh, primarily designed, uh, like we were talking about, for bat uh, recordings. Um, so yeah, it's uh, super data intensive, but it's a super robust system uh, and has, uh, yeah. Been 90 gigabytes. Yeah, 90 gigabytes a day. Yeah. Um, so then down here in our super high-tech cooler, uh, we have our infrasonic uh, device. Uh, and so the idea behind the cooler is we have an enclosure inside, a waterproof enclosure inside that houses the infrasonic sensor. But this sensor is super, super uh, sensitive to temperature swings. So the idea behind the cooler isn't to keep it as, at a certain temperature, it's to slow those swings. Uh, so they're less impactful on, you know, uh, pushing the data one way or another. Um, so yeah, between the three of these, uh, it's 0 0.05 hertz to 190 kilohertz, super, super wide, continuous monitoring. Um, and then this, uh, I should not leave out, is our ADS-B antenna. Uh, so basically that is looking for incoming uh, flight data uh, from flight transponder. Um, and that uh, is really, really helpful uh, with things like developing our machine learning tools. So not only can we say uh, we have found a plane at this point in time, but we can say what that plane was, what, what type it was, how far away it was, um, and that makes our data even that more, uh, much more rich. 
uh, that we can feed to the machine learning algorithms. Um, this is 1.0, and then this is uh, our enclosure box. It houses all of our local computing. Um, and then we're pushing everything out uh, back over to where we started, uh, which houses uh, the uh, computing sort of super server. Got it. So what's different in 1.5 over? So uh, first thing you'll notice is significantly more microphones. Um, so we've created an array here. Uh, you'll notice that this looks way less sturdy uh, because it is in development. It is PVC. Uh, we are working on figuring out what the best distance between microphones are uh, in order to capture far away aerial object signatures. Um, so uh, Alex, uh, who designed all of these towers, uh, is eventually going to build us a modular structure. Uh, so we can actually adjust on the fly uh, those distances. Uh, but right now we're really trying to figure out what's a sweet spot. Um, so this is uh, 40 inches. Uh, you'll see a microphone in the middle that's elevated. Usually this has a windscreen uh, on it that's super furry uh, design. Yep, exactly. Um, and you'll notice that uh, the design itself is kind of funky. Um, and the idea is to try to break symmetry. Um, so it, it's, uh, yeah, really, really critical that we mitigate as much noise uh, as we can, wind noise being a, a giant uh, thing that we have to fight with. Um, so I uh, don't know exactly how many dB this has knocked off, but it's been significant. Um, so yeah, the idea is uh, this can be roughly aligned to polar coordinates. Uh, and as a sound comes in, it's going to hit some series of these microphones based on the angle that it's coming in. And those, uh, you know, differences in time of arrival are tiny. Um, and they're also with continuous signals, which are pretty hard to extract. Uh, so we've created an algorithm that basically does cross correlation um, and figures out at what point did the sound hit each of these microphones. And uh, based on that can uh, perform a calculation saying it came from this angle. Um, so right now it's all about refinement. Um, you know, we're not even at the calibration stage. This is proof of concept stage. Um, and you know, we think it's going to be pretty important moving forward. If we do spot something anomalous to be able to say we heard something and not only did we hear something, it came from that direction. Uh, Potentially correlated with some rear. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so it's really everything we can do to uh to cross reference uh directionally is really helpful uh and up until now you know uh, amos is the omnidirectional system so we hadn't been able to help with that so that's the big improvement uh with phase 1.5 so once we get uh comfortable with where this is sitting uh eventually way down the road we'll publish a paper <laughs> but uh the next thing will be to ship this out to colorado uh to our other development site um, and start taking measurements, uh, capturing data, uh, and seeing what we can do with it. This is where the series of tubes for the world. Exactly. Yeah. And this, and this pushes us out to the world. Um, so yeah, it's, this houses, uh, a bunch of, uh, the architecture for local processing, uh, local storage, uh, and then, uh, serves as a hub to push stuff out to the cloud. Um, so yeah, this is very very lots of you know <laughs> lots of work went into this um exactly um so that alone is you know some serious development time uh lots of trial and error uh, but luckily we have an incredible uh computing team uh that has really uh figured out the ideal solution uh for where we stand now okay so so what what this does is it takes in the, the data we collect from the uh the audio the audio equipment uh, runs it through a classification model, so it basically uses a a, a neural network type model um, to distinguish between the different types of sounds we get, and that's so that we can classify what's in our audio audio sample. So, for example, if we pick up an air, air, airplane, we can kind of listen to it in in the file here, so you can just play the sound and listen to it um, directly sort of through the mic, and then look at how the model actually classifies it. So, in this case, you can see the prediction is it says it's an aircraft. Most of the time, there's like a couple of couple of flags where it changes slightly because it, the model's not accurate to a high degree of accuracy at this point. Nice. Um, but if you look at what it's actually saying in terms of the probabilities, depending on the number of classes there are, so the classes being 
class of vehicles, so the aircraft itself, the drones, the helicopter, um, motor vehicles, you can see it's primarily picking up uh, and predicting it's the, that it's actually the aircraft in this case. Um, and then once we've done that, we can just say in, in the, the data we've looked at, this is the percentage of, of time that we've seen that, that, that vehicle for, that, that vehicle class for. Um, and then we can we can apply that kind of real time on the data eventually. At the moment, it's running over uh, a, a number of files um, that you can either record or provide to it. Um, but yeah, the plan is to eventually do it in, in in real time. Are you guys are you guys seeing a lot of sound in the in the ultra and infrasound right now, or are you getting any like? So this is primarily based in the uh, audio spectrum. This one, okay. Um, we haven't we haven't done the infra and ultrasound yet. That that still to be done because those spectra are slightly different. Cool. And we, the model can do multiple sources, right? That's one recent development. Yeah, so th this this particular version of the model is a slightly older one. This one is, is imagine if you uh, you have a you know a box of toys and you, and you, you hand someone one toy and say, what toy is that? That's what this model does. So it's like, what am, what am, what am I most likely looking at? What the next one does is you hand it a box and say, right, what's in that box of toys? I want to know what, what is in that box. So that's multiple things all at once. So you might have like three or four different things all at once, like a helicopter coming by, birds, a plane, all that sort of thing. Um, and that's what the next version of the model does, which is kind of able to, to distinguish between multiple things all at once. Well, let me ask you, with all the effort that's going on at the Galileo project, are any of the sensors, whether it's acoustic, visual, or anything else, do you think the, any of those would be applicable for applying to commercial aviation to improve uh, safety or detection of objects while airborne? Uh... The acoustic system would be tricky, mm -hmm. uh, given that, you know, it's really important that we have a pretty low or a reasonable noise floor. Aircraft are pretty loud. Sure. Um, so, you know, if you have a device on board, you need to do some pretty clever processing with flipping phase. And even then, it's a pretty complex signal. Mm -hmm. So uh, there may be some folks in the military that, that you know, have solutions for that. But um, yeah, it, it, there may be applications, um, you know, talking to the other systems would be jumping a bit outside of my expertise, but the hope is that the more we refine, the more we develop, the more applications we'll find. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe that'll be one of them, um, holistically with the system. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so joining the project was definitely, uh, you know, uh, from emailing Avi to being on the first meeting was two days. Oh, wow. um, and uh, definitely joined the first meeting, had a ton of imposter syndrome. Uh, you know, I'm coming from industry uh, and I was seeing like Avi and like Stephen Wolfram was on the first call. Cool. Um, and, uh, you know, I could name 10 other people who I saw and was, you know, somewhat starstruck coming from outside of academia. Um, and diving in, uh, it was so clear. One of the coolest things about Avi, uh, one of the things that, that I appreciate behind the scenes with Avi is, uh, he appreciates people doing the work, uh, and results. And he doesn't have a lot of patience for people who like to talk, uh, just to hear themselves talk, uh, or come off as smart. Uh, and that was such a sort of welcoming feeling where I'm like, I know I can hunker down and do the work. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was incredibly lucky that a couple months into the project, uh, I got a co-lead. Uh, and we didn't know at the time, the team was small. Uh, the team now has 14 people on it, which is amazing. On the acoustics team? On the acoustics wow. team. Wow. Um, but uh, coming in, my, my co-lead came in. I was very intimidated. Uh, she had her, her PhD from MIT. Um, did her thesis uh, using hydrophones, so hydroacoustics, um, and it was kind of the best thing that happened to me on the project, um, where you know it took a couple of months um, of translating, uh, where I'm an expert in my field outside of sort of the scientific, uh, you know, academia field, um, and she was solidly entrenched in sort of scientific process. Uh, so oftentimes we'd be talking about the same thing, but we would have different terminology for it. Um, so there was this process of translation, um, but she came in and I think we sort of fed off of each other um, where I have my background um, and she's able to push that into a more scientific approach mm. um, and made be, me be more thoughtful. We talked about process, um, made me be more uh, thoughtful about each step of what I was doing and why I was doing it. Well, what did it. you bring to the team for her? 
Uh, good question. Uh, <laughs> uh, just a solid background uh, in understanding uh, how to record things, how to capture things, mm -hmm. how to manage the data, understanding how to analyze, at least from my side, the data. Uh, that's been another cool thing where um, it's been really cool to show the tools that I have at my disposal that mm -hmm. I use every day and to feel uh, sort of uh, surprised from uh, what's capable from the scientific team. And then vice versa, yeah. where I'm like, I, that's amazing that you wrote that Python script that does that thing automatically. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, as much as you appreciate her for her technical expertise and guidance, I bet she was extremely uh, happy with your ability to actually get things done with the equipment. <laughs> I, I hope so. Yeah, it's it's been uh, one of the uh, greatest collaborations of uh, sort of my career. Um, and the team expanded, so we got a, a machine, a dedicated uh, computing lead for our team who... Uh, you know, worked at CERN on particle physics, then moved into audio processing. Um, natural pipeline. Yeah, natural pipeline. <laughs> um, and so it's just everybody is uh, bringing their own expertise to the table in their own way. Um, and that sort of collision of industry and engineering and science and academia is, I think, really, really special. Um, where, you know, there's a, a team member who... Uh, is a, a design he's the head of a cto of um an anamorphic lens company uh and he's built a system that uh, a tracking system that uh, doesn't move the camera it moves mirrors mm. um and just brilliant brilliant folks that are all uh adding to the mix to to create something that's better than the sum of our parts uh, which is really amazing to be a part of in regards to sort of um going into the project, I had my own experience with um, my understanding of UAP and my interest and, and the real scientific mystery to me. I think in one of the other really cool things about the group of people that we've assembled is we have like the entire spectrum of, of understanding and like, uh, I don't want to say belief, but uh, sort of th thoughts around what UAP could be, where uh, on one end of the spectrum, we have people who can tell you the exact time of a craft the craft that appeared at the phoenix lights and all the the details around that and then in that same group we have uh people who can respectfully contradict all of that and then the first group can con you know go back and forth and then in the middle there are people who have no idea what the phoenix lights are <laughs> um and there's something beautiful about that because at the end of the day it doesn't matter because it's about the data mm -hmm. um and so that diversity of id of um diversity of thought uh, I think adds to the projects uh, in our understanding of how to sort of explore it. But at the end of the day, it doesn't impact our conclusions, mm. um, which I think is pretty special. Awesome. Well, I wish you guys the best of luck. This is an incredible project you're on, Andy. I can't believe there's there's that many people on the acoustics yeah, team. me neither. <laughs> um, you know, I'm really excited that we got an opportunity to look at your equipment today. Um, you know, I think the Galileo project is doing fantastic work. So I encourage all of my followers to go and support their project. Uh, we need data in order to move this conversation forward. And they have one of the best data acquisition projects uh, in play right now. Uh, Andy, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you so much. It's an honor.